Hi, everybody, and welcome to our November live stream. Um, as always, very excited to bring some real experts in the world of business and beyond to a panel to have a chat about various things that are challenges for leaders in the corporate world and I suppose in, in, in the hybrid world that we live in now post pandemic. Um, today, as always, we have a fabulous panel. Um, I, I, I get excited hosting these things because I get opportunities to speak to some incredible people and today is no exception. So uh, without further ado, I shall introduce the, the guests we have today. We have a large panel today, but a very, very good one. Um, first up, I'm going to introduce Ilana Zinnick. Um, Ilana is based in Canada, um, a country close to my heart. Uh, she's a leadership and organizational um, development consultant. She's had over a decade of formal leadership experience and she works a lot in the whole kind of concept of relationships and authenticity being key to everything we do uh, and uh, we'll get an opportunity to explore that today so Alana you're very welcome um, thank, you. thank you no problem uh, next up um, to balance the North American angle of what we're talking about today is Kevin Mulcahy or Mulcahy as the I'm sure you're called in America Kevin um, Kevin is based in Boston. Uh, he's a thought leader on future working and leadership um, and has some really cool views on this stuff. Kevin has done some remarkable things in his career, including um, being executive coach to the, the, the Harvard Executive uh, MBA program, which was a, a very cool experience. I'm sure Kevin will explore that as we go on. You're very welcome. Um, in, in Ireland, I also want to introduce Siobhan Sweeney. Siobhan, uh, a good friend of mine and pep talk and uh, a great lady. Um, Siobhan is the Global Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging uh, lead with HubSpot, um, having done some incredible work with an organization called Open Doors Initiative here in Ireland. And uh, Siobhan has some fabulous thoughts on, on, on not just diversity, but inclusion and the challenges as leaders we face in including people in our uh, workspace. Hi, Siobhan. Hey, Naomi. And, and uh, uh, finally, um, I, like, I, I'm very honored to introduce Frederick Nelting. And Frederick is based in Germany. He's a, a corporate mentor and leadership coach, um, and also has an awful lot of experience working in the area of, um, of burnout. And, and Frederick's family runs some clinics that kind of help people recovering from burnout. So Frederick has a unique view on that angle of things. So guys, you're all very welcome. I'm gonna uh, work very hard to make sure that everybody gets plenty of air time to talk because I think you all have such really cool things to talk about. I think today particularly is a conversation where I'm gonna try and stay out of the way as much as possible. So feel, please feel free. If somebody triggers something in a conversation, just jump in and ask your own questions. You don't. I, I, I don't feel the need to control the conversation. But I do think um, to start with, I think it's important. Like one of the areas that I'm looking at right now, and I think we can come at this from various different angles, but one of the things I'm looking at right now is, you know, there's all sorts of conversations going on about culture and trust and authenticity and all these different things about skill sets of leaders. And one of the fundamental issues that seems to come across with any of the corporate where I do a lot of external leadership work and a lot of the stuff that I'm coming across is the complete fear and inability of companies to give each other feedback, whether it's comfort in giving it or comfort in receiving it. And I think this is as relevant to culture and performance and productivity as it is to the whole concept of inclusion and, and the idea that, you know, it's, it's great that, you know, the hiring process is now bringing in people from different backgrounds and different skill sets and different knowledge types and different personality types. But how do we make it more, how do we actually make an environment inclusive? Uh, you know, and, and how do we avoid the situation where you've got 10 men and one woman sitting around the table at an executive meeting and they turn to the woman and say, here, can you take the notes? And I'm pretty sure every woman I've spoken to in leadership has had that experience at one stage in her career. So, you know, there's lots of things to talk about, but really when it comes to feedback, and I think you all have a unique insight into it, but Ilana, I might start with you. Um, you. You do an awful lot of work kind of coaching with executives. And when you're dealing with people who really struggle with the concept of feedback, 
um, what is it that 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 you feel is the, is the challenge, and 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 what is the kind of the advice I suppose you give people? Um, so I kind of see immediately two things top, pop to mind for me, and it's uh, on the giving end. Something that I find a lot of people just miss the mark on is is being specific and eliminating judgment from from their feedback. So you know. Finding the, first of all, I think the courage for a lot of people, it does take a lot of courage to step into that feedback space, both giving and receiving. Um, but people tend to come in from that opinion based perspective or just lacking detail in their in the feedback that they're providing. So that's something that I, that I often will coach and encourage people to do is, you know, take a step back and look at what's actually happening from an observable descriptive perspective and how can you eliminate judgment isn't always a bad thing um you know judgment can be just saying good job but if i just say good job to somebody that's not actually helpful to them in any real way as opposed to if i add in the layers of what specifically did they do really really well what do i want to see more of right so setting those expectations letting people know what success looks like from the leadership perspective and and then just uh supporting them to get to that that point. But mm. I think the flip side um, around receiving feedback is, you know, our, our egos get in the way, right? <laughs> so uh, human kind of human tendency, I think, is, uh, you know, that that drive that we have to kind of think, well, I, is this person safe for me to receive feedback from? Um, mm. And something that I often will offer people is just the the perspective that, you know, the people giving you feedback may not be experts in feedback, so their delivery might be a little bit rough, for lack of a better word. And uh, just practicing empathy, I think, is super important. So looking at, it probably took this person some courage to step into this space to provide me feedback. Um, how can I set my ego aside and just get really curious and, and maybe ask some questions or dig a little bit deeper to find out what's driving them to provide me with feedback and what's their intention. So looking at sort of that difference between intention and how I might immediately start to perceive it, um, I think mm -hmm. is really valuable. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? And Kevin, it's, it's also a thing that, you know, if you haven't done the work in building the trust, it's very hard then to expect somebody to sit down, you know, if, if, if people feel there's, there's an undercurrent in what you're saying, the, the message gets lost in the emotion. Um, what, what, what would your experience be? How do you work around that in your, in your career? Um, so, yes, and I think before um, all the steps that Elena uh, laid out, there's one other step that managers are being asked to do. And, and we have a lot of managers now in the remote environment that are pretty short on, I'll call it soft skills. And this whole area of feedback is a, a, a core foundational soft skill and people are not very good at it. And, and I wanna just isolate one of the points that Elena talked about. And that was that, that notion of when is it safe to receive feedback or the safety and one of the ways that managers can create an environment of safety is before the feedback conversation, um, have a check-in that is not about feedback. And I have a, a three very simple questions for that relationship building check-in. Mm. And the three questions are as follows. How are you? Shut up and listen to the answer. Just how are you? And Americans, North Americans use how are you as a greeting, like how are you? Yeah. yeah. But, Shut up and listen to the answer and hear how somebody is. You don't have to solve it. You don't have to do anything about that information, but hear it. And then a, a second question that's harder, and you can find your own way of, of getting there, is how are we? You have to know how our relationship is. Do I, are, are we coming? Uh, is this a high stakes meeting? Um, are, are you coming at me in, in the tent as a colleague? as a friend, as a boss, as, as a threat, as a, as a resource, like, how are we? And let's just put the question on the table and find a way of asking that question and establishing what that is to each other. 
And then the third one that that managers, um, this is the hardest one, but we saw saw it be, being done in the pandemic, is managers, people managers sharing, how am I? Mm. And sharing a little bit about themselves and where they are and opening up authenticity. We talked a lot about authenticity in the last two to three years. And part of authenticity is honesty and, and truthfulness and that you are, you say what you mean and you are who you present as. And, and you know, everybody has, as we saw in the pandemic, we had barking dogs and we had children, we had husbands doing crazy things and wives doing crazy things in our backgrounds. And, and there's a sense that managers are people too. And when employees have a sense of a manager as a person beyond their role, once we've got those three, how are you, how am I, how are we, then we set a nice foundation for feedback. Yeah, it, it, it's, I, I love that. And I, I think, Siobhan, I think that kind of brings me to kind of something that I've often thought about in, you know, when we're having these conversations about how am I and how are you, which mm. I think is really important. But it's also sometimes I feel like we don't acknowledge how people want to be communicated with. And, you know, and when, when we have a lot of conversations about neurodiversity at the moment, it's become the kind of the buzz thing uh, recently. Um, not for one second suggesting it's not important. It obviously is. But, but I think like a lot of things that happen in the diversity world, sometimes lip service takes over from actual action. And I know you're very passionate about taking that lip service and making it an action. Yeah. But in your, when you're looking at these conversations from, um, from the point of view of having the most impact for your organization, you have to think about all the people. And it shouldn't just be about the person who's working in diversity and inclusion who's thinking about this. It should be the whole organization. But what are your thoughts on that? So just a couple of nuggets there that you touched on, um, Niall, as you started talking. The research that I did um, as part of my master's when I looked and I studied why are organizations getting involved in diversity and inclusion strategies? Out of the 25 people that I interviewed from global companies, the main finding that came out of that research was for selfish reasons. They were doing it either to tick the box, to have more clients coming in, to add it to a vision or a mission statement. So again, it was for all very selfish reasons was the main findings out of that study that I did in 2021. Um, in terms of what I'm seeing, and both Alana and Kevin touched on it there a second ago, I think the, the, real, the real piece that was sticking out for me is people, it, people now, employees want to have that psychological safety. And I think that it all comes down to psychological safety. And do I feel safe in my organization? And even taking it that a step further, do I feel valued? Because when I think about culture, inclusion, belonging, that all links to psych safety for me. And that's that's core to, to everything. Also, I think just as well as we, we talked about managers there a bit and different people's styles. One thing that I really noticed as well is as leaders, have we looked inwardly at our own style and the way that we communicate with our employees? And I think that's so important because I know when I'd be standing in a room, I would use a lot of, I'm very handsy. I'm always talking with my hands, always. My body language of how I move around when I'm doing a presentation. I, I can't do that now in, in terms of me sitting down here. Well, I can, but it's it's not gonna it, it's not gonna translate the same way that it normally would. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an interesting aspect as well for leaders to reevaluate their styles. And I think linking their styles as well to the core values of the company, of themselves as well, is really, really important. I'm definitely, I know you talked about hiring practices and bringing in more um, diverse backgrounds into organizations. The one thing that I see a lot is when I work with our hiring team is people wanna know about diversity and inclusion. They wanna know about ESG. They wanna know about the social impact but they want to make sure that it's very real as well, that it aligns to their values. 
So it can't, I think that for organizations to succeed, Niall, it can't just be a tick box exercise anymore. I think leaders need to really reevaluate themselves, their styles. And I think that I'm noticing a lot more honest and open, transparent conversations with people in order for them to succeed, both on a personal level and as an employee, but as a professional level as well as a leader to make sure that I'm getting the best out of my staff that I possibly can. Yeah, I got it. So I, I completely agree. And then like we do, we do a lot of work around the kind of the concept of emotional proximity, you know, and this idea of, 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 you know, belonging and building relationships, being at the heart of team experience, team connection, team productivity, you know, um, Frederick, I know you, you, you're a big fan of, of that kind of thinking. Um, and you've done yes. a lot of work in this area. Um, what is, what, what would you say is the, um, what would you say is the barrier, I suppose, to organizations in Britain? I mean, when we're like listening to what, what Ilana, Kevin and Siobhan are saying, there's so much common sense and so much logic in it. And yeah. yet we know it is one of the fundamental barriers to organizations changing. Why, why do you think that is? Well, there are a couple of them. Um, you guys said so many good things and I would love to respond to. Um, and one thing is, I think, is that a lot of um, organizations think only uh, in short term and also the money spent short term and all this stuff it's not an investment to a healthy life of this organization you know it is uh, as a manager as a, in a big corporation usually you know at the at wall street and stuff they have to have the, the numbers so when i um, say okay let's uh, install um, a mental health program that maybe costs you uh, in total 100,000 or 200,000 i don't know they say, well, that is, you know, that's money right now, you know. I say, yeah, but if you lose one or two, uh, two um, important people in the business, you know, you lose 300,000, you know, it's estimated. Like, you know, like one leader uh, in a company is like 115,000 equivalent, equivalent of uh, loss when, you, when they go into burnout and depression. But they only think that far in that moment like well right now we had just we had the crisis right now we have uh, corona we have uh, the war and there's always the the reason not to do that and it, and and we've been trying to support a lot of companies over the years and and they they struggle with it and one big thing is um because the leaders are not willing to look into themselves because it's very scary a lot of the leaders that are on top right now um, mostly old white men, but you know, also old uh, white or uh, other women doesn't matter right now. They are they are beaten. You know, they they are very close to a burnout or a, a really major crisis, and they run into into ways of thinking to protect themselves. And when they open that open up that Pandora's box, you know, it's really hard. Uh, to deal with it and um, that's what we experience so often when the patients come to us they break down and they realize I was living a life for 40 years you know because I wasn't willing to look into myself and I think that's the chance when we're building up young leaders and we work with companies with the young leaders to install this introspection right away because um, when I want to give feedback or I want to have a good team I have to know myself first you know that that is the most important part because um, it explains to me also why I give the feedback and, and how I give the feedback and what effect it could uh, could have. And when I learn about these things, I could better feel into the other person and like, how would they receive it? And then when I realize, okay, people are different. And uh, for me, it's okay, this type of feedback, but for the other person, it's difficult, you know, it, 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 like a certain sensitivity to, to the topic, you know, that, that is so important. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted to say something uh, to Kevin, because you said, um, the simple thing, how are you? Uh, last week, I did a seminar for stress and resilience. And um, there was one a member who said, I don't, I don't believe my boss anymore when he says, how are you? He's not interested. It's just like nobody cares about me. It was very heartbreaking. Like a lot of people think they don't care about me. Mm -hmm. And then whatever feedback is, like even if I try to be authentic, if, 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 if my team thinks that, it will never be um, successful in that regard, you know. And also, with like other stuff, resilience. You know, a lot of companies want. I want to have my workers more productive. Mm. You know, I want to be them one hundred percent right away again. That's not the idea of it. You know, it's always 
money, 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 success, success, success. And we have to get this out of the way to have an organic success rate in a sense, you know, and that's hard. And I think we agree with it <laughs> and we would be willing to do it, but, you know, it's not easy. It is interesting, though. And actually, Frederick, maybe on that point, I might stay with you for a second. Um, you know, with the work you do, with the work you guys see around burnout and you do like you, you you're one of the leading minds in this area. Um, there's, there's clearly for what the, the, the data is telling us is that there's a clear appetite amongst workers for better feedback in companies, whatever that means in the research. But if you were to think about it, kind of reverse engineering it from what you guys are seeing at, you know, worst case scenario when people are absolutely burned out and let's face it, like every organization or somebody at least, you know, and everybody is probably pushed close to burnout at any stage in your career. It's probably only a, a balancing act depending on relationships you have and, and level of work and all that yeah. kind of stuff. But if you're reverse engineering that back to like creating that culture in the first place, yeah. you know, you're right. There is that kind of like, I, I had it in my career in sport where people would say, we totally understand what mental skill, how important mental skills are to athletes delivering performance. But what's the evidence that my investment's going to get a return? And you kind of go, well, in one hand, you're saying you need it. The other hand, you're saying you don't want to pay for it. And that's kind of where we're at. So where do you start? Do you, in, in your opinion, where do you start? And, and guys, jump in here and, 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 yeah. and share and, and feel free to, to, to ask. Yeah. Well, in, 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 in Germany, you always, like there's a saying in Germany, you know, the fish stinks from the head on, you know? So you have to start on the top at the CEO level. Um, if they don't are unwilling to change and really live this idea. I have, I have an example. Um, it has nothing to do with feedback, but it's like in a different way. We do Qigong with our um, employees mm -hmm. in, the, in the break. You know, it's paid time, but it's, you know, health, health time. And if the, if the, um, the doctors, the, the, the bosses, you know, the, the, the CEOs aren't doing that, yeah. There's less employers coming because they think if they don't go and I go, they think I don't work enough because they have work and they have to do my, it's like this, this thinking like, Oh, well, if my boss doesn't go, or well, you know, the person who is higher up than me, then I shouldn't go either. Yeah. And that, and that is, that is, that is the issue. And, uh, and uh, a leader has to know that, that you have to lead by example. That's why I say you have to start, to look into yourself and, and uh, so many uh, CEOs said, I want to, I want to help my employees. You know, it's like, it's always pushing away, you know, and it creates a distance. Um, they had to have to start with themselves and then within our society, we have to change. I mean, changing a, a system is really hard. I always think about, um, there is no current homosexual football player right now, officially. Still, we always talking like they come out when they finish their career because they know in this environment, I can't be myself. Mm. You know, it's a very difficult environment. And this is the same as in mental health. A lot of, you know, they think, yeah, we all talk about, uh, about burnout and everybody has it. And let's be open about it. But if not, if the boss isn't talking about it, or, you know, if somebody isn't brave enough, enough to talk about it, um, mm. nobody will. Yeah. yeah. I th because I think it's a weakness, yeah. Sorry, Frederick, I didn't mean to, to cut no, across no, no. there. I was just going to say for, for me, I think just as you're talking and what I'm hearing, it's really role modeling those behaviors and, and seeing them in action. Um, and that's yeah. what needs to trickle down to, throughout the organization. That's something that I definitely see within HubSpot, time blocked out from leaders. Um, the whole way down through the organization, we use modern help. So that gives employees the access to both coaches and to therapists. And you can see that time blocked out in their diary. Again, it's having that trickle effect from the top down. We concentrate on burnout plays as well, where there's an example is there's a week off during the during the summer, July, the first week in July, the whole company shuts down and that's a week of rest. There is unlimited PTO that you can add to either side of that and take that leave as well for an extended trip. But I think that that more people when they're joining organizations, they're thinking about and for selfish reasons too, thinking about what's in it for me and how can I protect myself? What are the benefits there for me? And looking into that 
a lot more even than I would have when I started my career years back. So I think that there's definitely like COVID-19 is a perfect example of us changing our lives and the way that things have shifted around from an, from an organization perspective. I think that when it comes to new hires as well, there is definitely a different mentality as well. Um, and more so from a unique place in terms of, well, what am I going to get out of this organization and how am I going to prevent myself from um, getting burnt out? So that really, really stuck out to me, Frederick, as you were talking. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, 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 no. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, Robin. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think uh, something that both Frederick and then uh, Siobhan, you, you spoke to a bit as well with that, you know, the leader modeling the way is super important if we're looking at creating that culture of feedback. And I think taking it, you know, a step further, again, kind of connecting back to something Kevin said right at the beginning around that relationship focus is just showing your human side, right? So if feedback, as an example, is something that as a leader, you perhaps struggle with providing, or maybe at one point or another, you have struggled with, I think acknowledging that and just kind of breaking it down for folks and saying things like, um, you know, it's tough to do, right? These are the, the tools or the strategies that you can use to provide high quality feedback. And I kind of liken it to that, you know, it's a, it's a muscle, right? So the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Um, so stepping into that sort of that, that space of emotional courage. Uh, and then the flip side, I think, is, is kind of goes hand in hand. But the leader also has to really model what it looks like to receive feedback well to start creating that culture as well, right? So um, totally agree with your your comment, Frederick, around it's starting at the top. And, uh, you know, how we, we're we always being watched as leaders, right? So how do you respond when somebody provides you feedback, especially feedback that you don't want to hear? Because people are paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. And and that is maybe also the, uh, the struggle for the leader when they know it. Um, I remembered it because I... You know, I was running a hospital, but I was smoking. That doesn't work together. <laughs> yeah. And it, it created, you know, like myself, like, you know, um, I am, I, I'm, pers I'm an addictive person. And when I, once I started smoking, it wasn't easy for me to quit. So I smoked like secretively, you know, like it was like, what, what, like am I 14 again or something? You know, because I didn't want the, the, the coworkers or the patients, you know, see that I smoke, you know, and it was what you said like I had, um, make it human it's like I had to accept my weaknesses and you know I was like, yes I'm smoking and I know it's not good you know but this is right now for me a certain coping mechanism and mm -hmm. um, I changed it now you know and uh, now I changed it I'm, I have been smoking for two years and everything is fine you know but it was really hard for me to to be a human and honest about it because I thought I had to be the role model all the time you know and and that is toxic and me. that's something that yeah. um like we 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 talk about in pep talk we try to have a culture of fearless feedback which is you know it, it's kind of open and it goes in every direction and i think you don't have you know like a lot of organizations you go into and you talk to senior leadership they'll tell you how great their culture is until you look under the hood mm -hmm. and if you're not willing to hear what you know the lowest paid person in the organization thinks. And if the CEO doesn't hear that, and you know, a lot of organizations are so many layers. If, you, if you're not willing to hear that and their frustrations, then you know, fundamentally your culture isn't what you think it is. And that's what we try to, to, to build with, with fearless feedback. And actually it is uncomfortable. And there's, it's funny, as you were talking there, you reminded me of uh, one of our founding members uh, is a guy called Bernard Brogan. And, um, anyone any, any of the Irish audience listen will know who Bernard is Bernard is a bit of a legend in Irish sport he's seven time national champion oh, there you go and, um, <laughs> but he tells a story um, and I, I've been fortunate like that I've interviewed Bernard many times and we've hosted loads of events together and stuff so I know his story inside out about his sporting career but he tells a story about the fact that there was a period where his team were being extraordinarily successful and he was getting an awful lot of media interviews and a lot of gigs corporate gigs and stuff off the back of their success. But, oh, somebody, somebody mentioned the, the remote world and barking. Um, that's my son going in the door, my dog going nuts. Um, but they, 
there was a bit of a, a jealousy amongst the team because not everybody was getting that opportunity. It was all going to him. And there was a, there was a meeting about it and conversations were had, which for him were really uncomfortable because it's an amateur sport. And he was kind of like, oh, look, I'm being asked. You know, I'm not actively going out taking money out of anyone's pocket here. But what they ended up agreeing with was that they were going to divide all the corporate opportunities across the squad. So everybody was getting equal opportunity. And it actually created a much more connected group. And he felt that even though it was in a conversation that made him really uncomfortable, it was actually something that massively benefited the organization. Um, and I think it's interesting, like when we're, when we're talking about uh, fearless feedback or, or it being led from the top, and look, we all know that these things need to be better. But we also know that it doesn't always work that way. And I just wonder if, if, if any of you have any examples you want to share of times when feedback didn't go so particularly well. Or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll rephrase that. Maybe I find that my biggest learnings from the work that I've done is when... You know, when I've gone in, like I remember after doing doing my master's and going into work with athletes and I had all these wonderful theories that I'd studied that were going to change the world. And I went in to sit down with a guy and I said, have I got great news for you? I've got all these visualization tools that are going to revolutionize your performance. And he just went, I can't do visualization. You know, it doesn't work for me. And I literally had to think, OK, well, this is about two years of study that's gone into the bin. Let's have a conversation. We figure out who he was and then we kind of found a way forward. And I always believe that, you know, our greatest successes come off the back of our failures and it's our ability to pivot when things aren't quite right that build us the, the, into the people we are. So, um, Alana, maybe with that, I'll come back to you and kind of think about, you know, maybe there's, there's, there, maybe there's negative experiences that you've seen, even if it's something you've seen from coaching someone that made that person better at what they do. Yeah, so I can think of two examples popped to mind and one is when I received feedback that was given poorly. Uh, and another was when I actually gave feedback. So do you have a preference as to which one I share or where I go with it? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first that comes to mind, this connects back to something Siobhan said a while ago about the, the importance and the value of feedback being connected to, you know, the mission, the values, the vision. Um, so this was just over a decade ago, I was just stepping into a new role and, you know, it was just like we probably all are when we started a new position, fairly nervous, definitely recognized that the learning curve was quite steep. And I was learning to uh, just facilitate courses. So something that, you know, had a certain, a uh, certain amount of skill that had to be kind of honed in on. And I remember I was co-facilitating with, uh, with a fellow on the team who had a lot of skill in that, uh, in that realm. And kind of the, the expectation that we developed was that I would receive feedback from him following the session. And so I remember sitting down with him at the end of the session and, you know, there had been many, many different aspects of that day that he could have provided me with feedback on. But instead of choosing any of them, he chose to say something along the lines of, you know, when I'm not wearing super bright lipstick, I wasn't wearing bright lipstick that day. He thinks that I look a lot more professional and that 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 carries a lot more weight with the group than as opposed to the days that I choose to wear lipstick. And I'm like, really, you know, no comments on how I chose to engage the, the participants, no comments on, you know, whether or not I knew the materials that I was presenting. Um, how I created space or, or the, the atmosphere that I created and developed within that room. It was focused in on this one thing that was so unrelated to the, the work that I was actually doing. Um, it not only provided me with zero valuable information, but served as this huge demotivator for me <laughs> uh, because I had nothing to work with, right? It was, to me, feedback is... Um, it's about that continual improvement. And if I was to just take his message at, at face value, it's just like, okay, so going forward, I wear no lipstick and that's, that's going to set me up for professional success. <laughs> so that's the, that's the yeah example that pops up from sort of that receiving side of things. 
um, I think about, you know, back when I was in a formal leadership position and before I knew any best practice around feedback at all, it was now I think back to it and I just cringe because I can remember doing, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings with team members and, uh, and one-on-one, -on -one, you know, kind of performance appraisals and knowing nothing about the value, you know, going back to what Kevin said, the value of spending that time creating the relationship and, and checking in. And it was such garbage feedback I was providing because I just literally, it was a one-way conversation, right? And I was just dumping and dumping. And I find that sharing stories like that with my clients now is actually really helpful. Again, going back to that humanizing factor, once you know better, you do better, hopefully. Um, but at that point, I I had no idea how to do better. And I just kind of was going through those check boxes. And uh, mm -hmm. you could sense the energy shift as people would leave my office or leave that conversation. Very rarely, I think, were those conversations actually uplifting them or helping them. Even when those conversations were me, again, saying, good job, you're doing this well, you're doing this well. Um, there wasn't that actual back and forth exchange. And uh, and I was definitely lacking the, the specifics and the detail to actually yeah. make those conversations meaningful. Yeah. I, I, I can add an example, a slightly different direction um, on what I learned about apologizing, which is another form of feedback. And I think apologizing or saying sorry is something that we really, all of us, uh, I've never really received a, a good apology. And I want you to think about the apologies we've made to others and the apologies we've received. And so what, what came about, and, and this is a very expensive lesson that you're all gonna learn for free here. Uh, this lesson cost me four grand and, and three days. Um, I, I had a business a, a decade ago and I made a business decision and it didn't go well for a Japanese customer. And something happened and what we thought would happen didn't happen. And he was furious. And I flew, uh, the, the end result after getting a bunch of advice on how to fix this. Well, he said, well, it's Japan, you apologize. And I don't mean Kevin sending an email and apologizing. I mean, you get your butt on a plane, you fly to Tokyo, you tell him you're coming over to apologize. You go into his, you, you meet his staff and he had gathered the whole team. You stand in front of the room, you apologize, and then you turn around and you fly home. You don't do any other business. You don't do anything else. Otherwise, it's not an apology. It's you flew on a business trip and you apologized while you were there. And he says, that's what you need to do, Kevin. And I was like, but, 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 but. He says, that's what you need to do, Kevin. And I did it. And I flew in, stood up in front of the room, apologized to everybody. They just looked at me, uh, went off back to their desk. I went back to the airport. I flew home. And my, my local rep said, that was the best thing you could have done. Everything is repaired. We're ready to sign a new contract on Monday. And it taught me, it got me to reflect on the nature of apologies and how we make apologies and how we make, we, we when we violate some thing or someone in the workplace through something that we've said or done, um, one of the arts of uh, being a great leader of others is the art of the apology and, and how we do that. So I'm now very careful and thoughtful on how I apologize if, if I believe there's been an infraction and make sure that the apology just has the apology and the call or the meeting for that apology just has the apology and nothing else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I've, that's my feedback was yeah. the, and an apology is a great tool in the repair or the a foundation building in a relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and when it's genuine and when it's made with sincerity. Yeah. So that's, that's and, what I have to learn. And I think it's also to keep the honor to, you know, like being an honorable person about it, you know, not like, I'm so sorry, you know, like it's, I made a mistake, I'm owning my mistake, you know, but it still have like 
the self love towards like because if you start destroying yourself and the other sees you and like okay that is very demeaning you know like uh, then I don't want to make a mistake and that scares me you know but like, we have to have a culture where we can make mistakes and where we learn okay if I if I'm honest about it upright about it you know and, and approach it with dignity and also towards myself and the others then it can work very well you know yeah, and the discipline Frederick was after saying I apologize having the discipline to not say but and here's what I meant <laughs> right it just yeah. shut up all right just yeah. apologize yeah. and yeah that, won't happen that's again the, that's the <laughs> hardest thing to do and yeah. and just that's what an apology is it has no justification has no ration it just is or the worst apology is when somebody says i apologize if it caused you offense <laughs> and they're turning it on to you that it's you know it's their fault that they took offense. <laughs> yeah. it's not what you did but, but yeah. what? One that sticks out for for me is um, I was attending board meetings um, with the CEO. I've been going to them on a quarterly basis on on one of the feedback sessions that I was having. Um, I was told to basically be seen and not heard going forward. And at the start, it really upset me. But I think then the more that I reflected on it was is this valuable feedback? And if so, can I take it on board? And if not, just let it go. And I think that there's that there's times that if feedback isn't valuable, we need to detach ourselves from it as well and not let it affect us. So Alana, when you were talking about like a decade ago in the way that you would have gave feedback, I was only talking to a sponsor this morning that really would have helped me in my career. And I was reflecting of when I started in my management career and the way that I would have given feedback to people. I would have been so focused on my numbers, exceeding targets that, that that's all that I concentrated on and was trying to push them harder and harder. And when I reflect on that now, I'm like, I'm not that person anymore. So I think it's leaning into empathy as well um, mm -hmm. and reflecting and, and looking at how far you've come in terms of the feedback that you give now. And I think that what you said is very important. Can I deal with the feedback? And that is, yeah. again, I have to know myself and have I have to be stable because when I'm fully stressed and, you know, I'm, I'm very close to being already sick in a sense, you know, I'm very stressed and, and I get really nice, good feedback. Uh, my inner drivers can turn them around and uh, create something. You're stupid. You're not good enough. You know, uh, it didn't make it perfect, you know, because they take over then. And we have to know that. And also and I, as a leader, when I have a very um, troubled person in front of me, an employee, employee who is very troubled, any feedback, the nicest feedback can be, Create, uh, you know, ch changed <laughs> to something totally different. So you can be the best feedback person in the world, and you still can create horror at night for that employee. Yeah. So oh, we have to be aware about that, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's why we have to help the employees also to to know themselves, you know, how they react, you know, how they react to authority, how they uh, react to feedback and everything. So they learn how you said it. You know, to deal with the feedback properly. Say, no, it doesn't help me right now. Let's put it aside, you know. Can yeah. I distinguish and, between but it's hard. <laughs> feedback and coaching. Yeah. And, and to me, feedback is a gift. And I'm giving it to you. And do what you want with it. It's an observation. Um, and if you do something with it, great. If you don't do something with it, fine. However, Coaching, and I distinguish when I'm saying, look, I want to coach you on this. Thing is, I'm providing these insights and these observations with an aim to having, uh, with an aim to improving some outcomes or having you change the behavior that gets us different outcomes. But there's an expectation when I'm coaching that you're going to change the behavior. Yeah. And, and sometimes I think we have to distinguish um, feedback is a gift. Coaching is an expectation is how I distill it down. And that the person, the recipient knows the difference. Are you giving me feedback or are you giving me coaching? But I also think, Kevin, there's, there's an important point that, you know, there is that traditional view that, that feedback or, you know, project management or whatever, it's all top down. It's all, 
you know, it's almost like the person in management or leadership is this voice of wisdom and everybody needs to hear what they have to say. But I think the reality creating a new culture in the workplace is that it has to flow both ways. And I'm really interested and I'm conscious of time. So I'm going to kind of start to kind of wrap things up. But I'd really love to hear your thoughts on creating that culture where it's coming back up the chain, where where a manager, you know, is, you know, potentially being coached from somebody in their team and being open and like we talk about vulnerability, we talk about authenticity, we talk about trust, but how do we create that culture? And for anybody listening to this conversation who goes, yeah, I really want to improve the way we do feedback. How do you improve it so that everyone in the company feels like they have a voice in influencing the direction or living the values of the company? Alana, maybe you want to take that? Sure, yeah. Um... So something I often share with uh, with the leaders who I'm working with is the concept of feed forward, which is, you know, feedback is typically reactive. Uh, so we're giving feedback after something has happened and feed forward is just more proactive. So it's more of asking for advice or asking for people's suggestions, opinions on how you can move forward um, in terms of developing a specific skill. And so when leaders demonstrate feed forward and actually solicit ideas and solicit suggestions from, from you know, different levels of the organization and their teams directly, that starts to really shift the culture as well, right? So of course it has to be combined with, um, with that leader receiving those suggestions or that feed forward in a positive way, um, not getting defensive, being receptive and open. Uh, I think managing expectations of the people who are providing the feed forward. So as an example, not every single suggestion is going to be actioned, but creating that space where people's voices are heard. And, you know, eventually, at least what I've seen with a few of the teams that I've been working with is that starts to create enough momentum that members of the team start practicing the same thing. So, you know, when it comes back to that leader really saying, I'm looking at improving my my ability to, you know, engage different members of the team. How do you think I can go about doing that? And then just sitting and being quiet and letting people provide ideas and suggestions regardless of their position and integrating the ones that that make the most sense. So, um I think that can carry a lot of uh, a lot of impact for sure. Frederick yeah, um, I think the, the the feed forward is a is a, a great example. Um, it, I, I think it's that that makes it a transparency. You know, like you have to be uh, transparent about the process, about the ideas, about your feelings. You know, that then you have a culture that um, is very open, and and then th there is not much feedback, how you say. You know, like uh, in retrospect, uh, needed. And the idea of um, sharing ideas, and you know, it doesn't have to be changed. And I work a lot with improvisation, and there is. In an improv stage is yes and and it's not yes but and it's not no because it's yes and and uh, if you want to have brave people on stage I mean, like when i teach them um they have to have the feeling that they have an idea and i accept it in any any regard so they they are brave enough to do it again because mm -hmm. if, if you say yes but yes but yeah, we've tried it before. You know, no, no, no. I've, I've, you know, I've done it before. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Then nobody is uh, willing to to chip in anymore, and there is no way forward in any creative process and in innovation process. You know, and um, that is very important to to also pick up the idea of the other person, and 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 celebrate it in a sense. You know, and it doesn't have to be in the end the way we do it, but it still has to have a value for the person to have said it because if not. A lot of insecure people will shut up or smart people will shut up <laughs> because they know, okay, uh, he wants to do it his way or she wants to do it her way. Whatever I say is not good enough, so I better shut up. And then that's that's a problem. That's, there's no transparency, no way. And uh, yeah, that's my thought about it. I love it. Siobhan, from your perspective with the work you're doing, what would be the... You know, if there was a wish list or a, a, a you know one major change that you could see in the corporate workplace or something that you're working on, what would you say is kind of the the big win 
for 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 you in relation to all of this and in improving a workplace environment for people yeah i think that i think that there's when it comes to this conversation and, and people i think when it comes to transparency in particular i think that we have a long way to go and i think that sometimes organizations come up with almost like a wish list of all the goals that they're going to achieve. And it can be so ambitious mm. that come towards the, the end of the quarter, end of the year, we haven't even got through half of them. I would scale back in terms of the things that we're actually trying to focus on and do it and measure progress. But most of all, let your employee know, know how you're actually doing and give feedback along the way. I think even as I was listening to everybody talking up there and giving their different ideas, like I was thinking about reverse mentoring, listening circles, but also EMPS is something that we do on a quarterly basis. There's no point in asking people for their feedback and going and monitoring these different things if we're not going to make changes or not going to tell them in terms of the roadmap that we actually have in place. So I would, I, I, if it was me and the one thing I would do is scale back and make sure the things that we are doing add real value and that we're measuring that growth, but also telling people about the success and the growth that we've made and how we're going to build on that for the following year, rather than committing to doing loads of things and not achieving any of them at the end of the, the period. Yeah, great point. And I think, I think that's the, that, that's a great point to leave it on actually is, is everything every initiative you introduce is pointless if it doesn't have an impact and if we're not like i find um in a lot of organizations that you know you you can get some really high quality feedback when you're open to hearing it but if you don't take any action off the back of it it's just words you know you're just having a chat and that's where ilana back to your point about the feedback being you know if if there isn't any value on it if there isn't any, like, I mean, what are you going to do with the feedback? It's like we, we delivered some content for our Apple a while back and uh, I got some feedback from somebody going, we didn't like it. And I'm kind of going, that's fair enough, you know, <laughs> but, you know, what do I do with that? Did you not like the sound quality? Did you not like the actual content? Did you not like the color scheme? You know, did you not like the people involved? You know, there's there's so many things that, like, we didn't like it means nothing. Yeah. You know, is is it that you just personally didn't like it? You know, or or you know, it's like when when people take offense to something that's said these days, which I really struggle with. But you know, it's are you offended individually? And if that's the case, is what the person said really that offensive, or is it just you taking offense of it? You know, and it's kind of like how do we have a conversation that changes that environment, changes that mindset? Um, guys, really love the chat. Amazing. Um, I feel like. Um, with the time we have left, I might just leave a closing thought for each of you, if you'd like. Um, just a, a, something that kind of sums up everything we said from your perspective and from your line of work. Kevin, maybe we can start with you. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I'll say the challenge that we have ahead of us is how do we have each of our employees or colleagues feel that they belong and what is it that they belong to? And I think that will tie together um, how, how we apologize, how we uh, emphasize our values, uh, what's, the, what's the behavior we want from everybody around us, what's the worst behavior we're willing to tolerate before we give feedback or uh, take on corrective action. So, so the theme is how do we make a more of an effort on helping everyone around us feel that they we, we all belong on the same community on the same team awesome does anybody else want to i'm happy um, to step in oh. <laughs> um so i think you know again connecting back to to just the fact that the leader really does set the tone so um modeling and acknowledging perhaps uh when you've dropped the ball or when you're not providing quality feedback, when you're not receiving feedback well. But the other thing I would add, and I, I know I've shared this with you before, Niall, I share it with a lot of my clients is, uh, it's actually a quote from Brené Brown's um, Dare to Lead program. And so she says in that program and in that book, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. And it's such a simple statement and something I share with 
with my clients all of the time because I think when least uh, in, in Canada, <laughs> our culture is often, you know, to half half lob some something across the fence, right? Half mm -hmm. give the feedback and hold back just a little bit because perhaps we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Perhaps we're not sure how to articulate the feedback. Um, maybe we just don't have the courage to to share and fully purge ourselves of the feedback. But as long as it's again connected to the purpose of the work um, and holds value and meaning, as long as you're keeping your judgment out of it, providing that feedback in as clear of a way as possible is actually going to be the most impactful and the most helpful to your team members. And you know, oftentimes if you're holding back, they're not they're not likely to have an opportunity to receive that feedback from somebody else. Um, so always looking at, again, if your intentions are to help that person grow, develop, and, and change for the better, making sure that you're purging yourself and, and being really, really clear in that feedback, I think is, is super important. Awesome. Frederick? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I think maybe um, the, the basis being self-aware and allow your uh, um, colleagues and employees to be self-aware as well, because that is the most important thing. And that gives me the basis to know what I actually, you know, clear feedback, I can only give when I know who I am and what I want. And um, I also think, especially with the agile work and, you know, the, the, the hybrid world and transformation, that feedback was hierarchical, you know, like first I, the boss, tells somebody it gives feedback you know and i think we also work now in an, in an environment where feedback is felt like oh you want to you know you want to be my boss but we're we are equal you know and i think we have to get rid of this idea that feedback is a boss telling his employee or a leader telling his employee it's more of a feedback it's like hey i'm aware of this you know and take it or leave it and maybe it helps you and maybe it helps our relationship but it's not me telling how to do the job and that i am smarter or better than you and i think that is also a very important base mm -hmm. of, of this feedback problem we have right now because we think oh we're all equal and if you give me feedback you think you're better than me and that is not that is not <laughs> fruitful <laughs> yeah 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 um, Siobhan, final word to you for me um niall it's foster psychological safety within your teams that's the big one lead with trust respect empathy I think that there's so much going on in the world right now between a war. We don't know what's going on behind closed doors with people with caring responsibilities, with children at home. There's just so much going on outside of work. Um, there's a whole other life people have behind what they're doing on their screens or whatever way they work. So just be kind and make sure that the people come can come to work um, and talk to you if they need to. Fabulous. Guys, thank you so much for taking part. I hope uh, everyone listening got some pearls of wisdom out of our chat. Um, I look forward to catching up with you two individually. Uh, have a great week, guys. Thanks so much, and we'll talk to you all again soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.